we turn our attention to the Hindu goddess Durga. I first learned about her during my years studying and practicing yoga. Yoga developed as a non-sectarian devotional practice, and many of the physical postures, the asanas, reference Hindu mythology and symbolism. Yoga is as much about philosophy and meditation as it is about bending your body in certain shapes. I completed 200 hours of yoga teacher training in two different traditions, so that's 400 hours of training that was heavily steeped in the history and the philosophy of yoga. And I thought that I knew a fair amount about Hinduism, and I even thought that I had a pretty decent grasp of Sanskrit. But over the past few years, I've come to learn that my knowledge of Hinduism is uh, limited and definitely Eurocentric. And it turns out that my Sanskrit is kind of terrible. <laughs> but I'll do my best to respectfully, to respectfully pronounce the terms that I'll use today, knowing I'm not going to get it totally right now. Sorry. So here's the thing about studying the divine through any of this. I always start off feeling like I have a decent working knowledge of a subject. And the more I learn, and honestly, the older I get, the more that I realize that I only have a little tiny piece of knowledge. And no matter how much I learn or experience, that tiny piece of knowledge is always going to be a tiny piece of knowledge. And this, of course, is why we gather as a worshiping community. We bring our pieces of knowledge and our experience together in the hopes of walking away with a little bit more than we had when we came in. And so I approach the subject with a heart of humility. And in this congregation, we're very lucky to have a few folks with us that have a much bigger piece of knowledge and experience with Hinduism than I do. And I'm truly grateful that they have been willing to share that knowledge and that wisdom with me in the preparation of these services. I sat down a few weeks ago with Latika Mangrokar to talk through my ideas and she impressed upon me a few things I'd like to pass on to you. First, Hinduism is ancient, and India is vast. There are multiple versions of the mythological stories and multiple interpretations of those stories. None of them is right. And secondly, this is a big one for me. I said that I was worried about cultural misappropriation and Latika kind of chuckled, and she said, well, it's already all been stolen. <laughs> I appreciate her graciousness and her generosity, and I want to be clear that my goal today is to respectfully borrow from Hinduism by interpreting a message for this specific audience, because I have found some true beauty and value in these stories, and I want to share that with you the best way that I can. <clears throat> Dorga is a compelling character to me for several reasons. For starters, she is fierce and maybe even a little terrifying at first glance. The goddesses that have been most popularized in the West tend to be a little uh, predictable. predictable. They are often associated with fertility they are the epicenters of kindness and love. They are comforting. They are typically highly sexualized in the most heteropatriarchal of ways. And not all of them, but a lot of them. And then there's Dorga, who has nothing to do with any of that. She is beyond the Western tropes of goddesses being gentle and nubile. She is basically a demon-killing machine. <laughs> so to recap and expand on the story that I told our children earlier, she was born out of a deep necessity. The buffalo demon, Mahishashora, had taken on harsh aesthetic spiritual practices for thousands of years in the hopes of gaining a boon or a spiritual gift from Lord Brahma. Mm -hmm. And he did reward, Lord Brahma did reward Mahishashora, who asked for immortality. The boon was granted. In a way, when Lord Brahma promised that Mahishashura could not be killed by a man or a god. Very specific. <laughs> Thus began a 100 year reign of terror in which Mahishashura, convinced that he was immortal, <coughs> did exactly whatever he wanted. He enslaved all of humanity, he 
exiled the gods from heaven. There was an outcry, and the gods appealed to Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva to do something. I think I told the kids Krishna. I think that happened. I'm sorry. If those are your kids, please correct that for me. Not, not Krishna, Shiva. Now, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva are sometimes called the Hindu trinity. Brahma is the creator of the world. Vishnu is responsible for its upkeep. Shiva destroys the world in order for it to be reborn. And in this way, these three gods are the keepers of balance in the universe. And now the cosmic order was upset. So the other gods appealed to the keepers of order for help. But Mahishashura cannot be killed by a god. What can they do? They combine their energies in order to make something new. They give of the best of themselves in order to create something that reaches beyond them. And from this, Durga is born. Depending on the version of the story, she has eight, 10 arms, or 18. She is given a weapon for each hand or a tool, a gift from another god to aid her in her fight against evil. She is also given a tiger or a lion to ride upon. I mean, how boss is that, though, right? <laughs> like, the American version of this would be like if the love child of George Washington, Paul Bunyan, and The Rock rode in to battle on a giant bald eagle <laughs> with Kid Rock blaring in the background. I mean, it's as hardcore as it gets. <laughs> she meets Mahesh Ashura on the battlefield, and, and here I will concede that there are versions of the story that have a sexual tone with her taunting Mati Shashura on the battlefield. But what's different from most Western tropes is that she is the keeper of power in those interactions. He says, rule with me, and she says, no. They fight for 10 days, and in the end, she is triumphant. He could not be killed by a man or a god. A Durga is neither of those. She kills the buffalo demon with her trident. Balance is restored, and humanity and the gods rejoice. This victory is celebrated annually during Durga Puja, which was October 4th to the 8th of this year. I absolutely fell in love with this story during my yoga studies. And I read a transliteration of the text that describes the battle between Durga and Mahishashura, and I heard commentary several instructors over the years. The text is called the Devi Mahamayam. Through a series of stories and hymns, it reveals that the ultimate reality of the universe is feminine. This belief is at the heart of the Shaktism tradition of Hinduism, Shakti being divine energy, divine feminine energy. This is an entire religious tradition that filters Hinduism through the lens of the divine feminine and its essence is captured in this text. The transliteration of the Mahatmaya that I was given includes the following verse. I meditate on the three-eyed goddess, Durga, the reliever of difficulties. The luster of her body is beautiful like lightning. She sits upon the shoulders of a lion and appears very fierce. The maidens holding a double-edged sword and shield in, her, in their hands are standing at readiness to serve her. I know that that's a lot of terms and philosophy to throw at you, and I'm sorry, but I think that it is important to read a bit of the original text and to contextualize the story within the tradition of honoring the feminine. And here's what I was taught about interpreting this story. And keep in mind, there are a million interpretations, and this one came from a white lady whose name was Shannon. <laughs> <laughs> Mahishatra, the buffalo demon, is the symbol of the imbalance of nature. Remember, he enslaves humanity, and he throws the gods out of heaven, meaning that nothing is right in the world. He was also part demon, part buffalo, meaning that he is the embodiment of animal life aggression. He is strength without wisdom. And Durga, on the other hand, is made of pure light. She's a goddess. Her nature is fiery and aggressive, but she is in control of her impulses, unlike this animal demon hybrid. She uses her natural aggressive tendencies to protect humanity and to restore the natural order of the world. 
they have the same capacity for violence and despotism. But her essential nature is benevolence rather than malice. <coughs> and what if maybe this is an allegory to the struggles of being human? Perhaps the story can be interpreted in a personal way. Our nature is to have both positive and negative tendencies. In Sanskrit, our thinking and behavioral patterns are called samskaras, which can either, which can either be positive or negative. Now this is one of the most fascinating yoga concepts to me. Here's this, this ancient understanding that our thoughts and our behaviors create patterns that get worn into our mind like ruts in a rope. And thousands of years later, B.F. Skinner, the father of cognitive behavioral therapy, demonstrates that the electrical impulses of our brain synapses follow, follows patterns that can be altered or entrenched based on our thinking and our behavior. The more we think or do something, the more our brain is inclined to think or do that thing. So I'm sorry. We all have established patterns, some of them negative, some of them positive. We spend our whole lives battling those negative samskaras, some of us more than others. Perhaps it's a tendency to catastrophize or an inability to enjoy the good things in life without thinking about how they will end. Or maybe it is a constantly running inner dialogue about how it will never be good enough. Maybe it's an addiction or an eating disorder. Maybe it's all of the above. Negative samskaras are hard to break. And I've learned that over the years that trying to fight negative patterns with negativity is like trying to fight a fire with gasoline. <laughs> Just gets worse. Yoga and cognitive behavioral therapy both provide ways of breaking those negative samskaras without focusing on how bad it is that the samskara exists in the first place. They are compassionate ways of overcoming those patterns. Compassionate yet fierce. As a person who has worked through a few and still works with a lot of very wily negative patterns, the story of yoga overcoming Mahish Ashura has taken on a great deal of personal meaning for me. I understand this as a story about a force of negativity that is powerful beyond belief, powerful enough to enslave me, to own me, powerful enough to depose God from God's rightful place in my heart. Negative patterns that run random leave a trail of chaos and destruction. And in the midst of that wreckage, and that heartache, there is hope. Yorga, the reliever of difficulty, was armed to the teeth and riding a tiger, reminds me that as rife as my brain might be with negative patterns, I also have the capacity for fierce righteousness. I choose my thoughts. I choose my behaviors. And from her, I draw the strength, the courage, and the weapons that I need to conquer my inner demons. And another word about the, the tiger or lion, I might be a little bit obsessed with this. <laughs> Some understand that tiger to be a symbol of power, action, strength. Now, I was also taught to think of it as a symbol of balance. Yorga has all of the ingredients to be a force of terror in the world. She is fierce, but she is also compassionate, yeah. sensitive to the plight of others. She is the reliever of difficulties because she has found balance that allows her to use her awesome power for good. And when we are balanced, we can also use our awesome power for good. Dorga is a compelling symbol of the power of good in this world and in our individual minds. A power that is active and strong and feminine all at the same time. As we continue our exploration of the divine feminine, May we each find our own relationship 
with the fierce, beautiful, perfectly balanced energy that is represented by Mahadurga. May we find in her story the hope of triumph for our own struggles with our own beings, inner and outer.